What do you do when you've cut all that you can cut? When it comes to schools, every cut hurts. It hurts the children, parents, teachers, administrators, and the towns they reside in. We're talking the school funding crisis now on At Issue. I'd like to thank you for joining us on At Issue today. I'm Fred Peralta. When I first came to Charleston back in the 70s, it seemed that every small town had its own school, its own sports team, and therefore its own identity. The consolidated school was the exception, not the rule. Today we find ourselves in the perfect storm for school funding. Late or decreased state funding, shrinking uh, rural populations, and higher testing requirements. And no matter how much we love to go to the football field on a Friday night, Many towns and school districts find themselves facing the real possibility that no longer of having a school just down the block. Dr. Bobby Mattingly, the regional superintendent of schools in our area is here, and we'll talk about the plight of the smaller school district. Can they hang on and survive? Should they? First of all, let's review some stories from Newswatch team on some school, local schools and the tough decisions they have to make. We've reduced a, uh, quite a bit of our supplies, and we've been doing that you know, progressively over the last three years. So those those supply items are, are pretty; those supply budgets are pretty much getting to the bare bones. That's why the Neoga School District is planning on eliminating 12 teaching positions from the district. A move the superintendent says could save more than $450,000. We're not replacing computer systems. We're not um, buying the newest technology with iPads and things like that. Cuts to technology and personnel means changes in the classroom. Neoga Superintendent Chuck Castle says class size may increase and entire grades at the middle and high school could be consolidated. Outside the classroom, the district is also considering cuts to high school athletics. And while some parents are supportive of the plan... They have a huge decision to make and I would not want to be in their place. So for them to make the decision that they did, I think they're going about it the right way. Others aren't so sure. I'm totally against it. It's it's going to be, I think it's going to hurt the kids a lot if they do that. Because it, putting the bigger kids with the younger kids, it's just, I think it's going to cause a lot of chaos. But Castle says no matter what happens, the state will have to step in. So they budgeted for us to get a, le a level of funding. They shorted us 100000 one year. They shorted us 300000 this year and they're planning on shorting us 600000 next year. That's the kind of thing that we're dealing with. So without some kind of a leveling out of that, we won't have a choice. In the yoga, I'm Sean Copeland for WEIU Newswatch. There aren't really any other options. We are trying to take the less damage that we can, and we don't want to compromise the quality of our program. Yes, this is going to be painful. The Arcola School District met recently to discuss the eliminations of nearly 10 paraprofessionals, all freshman sports, and reductions in textbooks, building operations, and transportation costs. But Superintendent Jean Krastoski says with the state behind in payments, this is only the beginning. I'm telling you about reductions that are known, which is, you know, a, like a $500,000 reduction in general state aid this year. It's what we're preparing for for next year that we're doing the cuts for because it's going to be an 80 percent proration suggested for next year. And what 80 percent proration translates into is another budget cut of about half a million dollars for our COLA schools. School Board President Jim Crane says the only way the board can survive with cuts like that is to change. We've hit a point where when we do our long range projecting, um, if we if we don't change what we're doing now, we're going to be out of money and be in trouble just like everybody else. And Crane doesn't want that to happen, not as the school board president or as a parent. The education that we have is going to, be, is going to suffer because of the cuts, no, no doubt in my mind. And I got kids here, so it's not good. But we have to do what we have to do as a board member and, and elected members of this community to make sure we keep the doors open long term. Looking at education long term in Illinois for districts like Arcola. This is a bad deal all around. It's bad for the community. It's bad for the kids. It's bad for the parents. It's bad for the state. It's bad for the future. You know that we have to make cuts like this when you're trying to do what's right. But it's something we have to do and unfortunately it, you know it's outside factors 
that are causing us to have to do what we have to do. Arcola and Nioga aren't alone. Villa Grove and many other schools in our area are still trying to navigate through this crisis. In fact, a junior high in Casey was closed earlier this year to save money. The district is $800,000 behind in payments from the state. The prospect of the money faucet being up from the state being cranked open is still very, very unlikely. So these small communities will have to find a way. With me today is Dr. Bobby Mattingly, uh, the regional superint uh, school superintendent for REO uh, District 11, and someone who's familiar with these issues and will help me find the way through uh, these tough, tough school funding issues. Dr. Mattingly, um, what can these schools do? Well, they're doing what they have to do uh, to survive right now, and that is they cut teachers, they're beginning to cut programs, but, and unfortunately, they're cutting the morale in their schools, in their communities, and it's devastating. But they are left with no choice. So when faced with very, very difficult choices that they don't have a whole lot of options, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you decide what to cut? You know, that's a very good question because the state, is all of the attention is on, of course, the core subjects. Mm -hmm. And those are the subjects that we test on. Mm -hmm. And those are the English language arts, math, sciences. And so we have to maintain those in order to be eligible for state funding. Mm -hmm. So the programs that, um, that suffer are the programs that really keep a lot of kids interested in school. For example, the arts. Okay. Uh, both music and uh, art, other art subjects, uh, vocational programs are at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, Foreign language programs are at risk, and it's all of these things that makes education have depth and breadth. And I can tell you, there's a lot of kids out there that don't come to school for English language arts, math, and science. It's a, the other things that, uh, that create interest. So the old curmudgeons might say, well, you know, you teach the basics, teach the basics. Everything else is fluff. You're saying that's not the case. Uh, that is not the case. Our schools, because of these cuts, are, are turning into shells. Okay. They're not turning into places, they're taking away places where kids want to be mm -hmm. because that's where their social interactions are, that's where they're growing up and learning to become adults, that's where they take the, the, uh, the talents that they have and learn to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps so that they can, you know, reach their potentials as human beings. These cuts are making it so there's a huge group of kids out there that don't have any boots. And they're not going to be able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. What sort of programs are getting cut? Um, like I said, the music programs mm -hmm. and arts, and that's near, I think that the arts in our schools is, is as important as anything else. They're about the quality of living. They're about the environment that, that we strive to work better mm -hmm. and, and be productive. Um, a lot of the vocational programs have been cut back. Uh, I, one of my jobs is to go and... Um, you know, look through schools and inspect them. Mm -hmm. And it's been devastating for me to see empty classrooms where once there were shops uh, where kids were doing woodworking and welding and all those sorts of things, things that lead to careers mm -hmm. and they're setting empty or they're being used every other year because, you know, they, they don't have the money to hire those types of specialized teachers. Now, you hear about how we have to educate students for the 21st century jobs. Uh -huh. You know, technology, uh, electronics, you know, service careers, those sorts of things. Can you prepare students for those types of positions when you're scaling back everything else? Uh, be my opinion, but I think well, not. Well, that's what I'm asking you. <laughs> I think not. Uh, you know, there is a huge emphasis on technology in our schools. But, you know, it seems that people think that that's having computers in front of kids. Mm -hmm. Well, it's more than that. It, it, technology is learning how to, to live and be successful in, in the 21st century mm -hmm. society where you get your information, a lot of it, or anytime you want information, you can go to the Internet and, and pick it up. Uh, you have to know how to use all of our uh, technology in everyday living. So we're in a funding crisis. How did we get there? Um, a lot of educators will say that un, um, unfunded mandates okay. helped us get here. Okay. And, and I would agree with that because we're asked to do a million zillion things in our schools 
uh, that aren't funded. Mm -hmm. uh, also, particularly in our region, um, the amount of free and reduced lunch students, which relates to poverty, mm -hmm. is growing mm -hmm. because we have, uh, you know, lost some industry and and uh, our whole economic um, feeling around in, in a lot of our region has kind of taken a downward turn because of the slow erosion of uh, community resources that we have. So are other school districts, say suburban school districts, Chicago school districts, uh, the, the Quad Cities, are they having the same issues? Uh, it's my belief that the suburban school districts are not mm -hmm. uh, strapped like we are. Uh, it's like comparing night and day to compare our schools with theirs. Um, they can offer things that we can't even imagine. Okay. And so uh, from what I see, the urban schools, or not urban schools, but suburban schools, they're doing very well. Mm -hmm. um, but around here, uh, we, you know, it scares me. Public education as we know it is dissolving before our very eyes in this region. That's, a, a, that's an eyebrow, eyebrow raiser. So dissolving in what ways? I mean, it's just the... We're eating at the foundation of education? You know, people in our area, they drive by our schools and they see a school building where they went to school and it looks the same. Mm -hmm. And, you know, parents of our students and grandparents of our students, they got a good education in our schools and they say, well, you know, things look okay. They go to the, the, to the uh, athletic events mm -hmm. and, you know, the kids look happy. They're, they've got nice uniforms and everything's going well. But you know, you can start going inside of the school during the day, like I have been during our inspections, mm -hmm. and you see how our public education is becoming eroded by the mere fact of empty classrooms, uh, larger class sizes, uh, you know, the, the people who need the most are getting less mm -hmm. because of the school cuts. And you know, our founding fathers uh, said that we all need to educate all of our people and once that is taken away from us I fear for the future of public education in our state period. Well that's uh, that's very bracing. Now let's look at some of the cuts that have been made that have been talked about in this package the package we just saw in some other articles I read. Neoga is cutting 12 of 55 teachers uh, my math is not as good as it used to be, mm -hmm. but I think that's over 20%. That's devastating for Neoga. How do you handle the same number of kids with 20% fewer adults supervising? You put into uh, kids into classes that they don't particularly want to be in. Mm -hmm. You uh, put the overload on teachers so that they have to do more and more for less. Mm -hmm. And uh, you stretch your you stretch your limits to the point of, you know, is it worth even trying to maintain in some instances mm -hmm. when you're stretched so thin? Now, one of the answers to these, to a question is the concept of consolidation. Mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier on, consolidation used to be handled, used to be only for the very tiny rural school districts. They all get together, build a high school in between them all have some sort of name that nobody knows where they're from. Is consolidation an option for some of these schools or not? Uh, many of our schools are looking into consolidation, but uh, if you look at our region, the school districts are huge areas. Now there's not, there are not many people within mm -hmm. the area, but you talk, uh, start talking about consolidations, you're also talking about putting kids on buses for an hour and a half, two hours for one way trip to a local high school, okay. and once again, who, uh, what, what child is going to relish that bus ride each and every day? Uh, consolidations don't save the amount of money that people would think that they save. Why not? Because you still have the same amount of students needing the same amount of classes, so you still have to hire a teacher for to cover that amount of students. So when you consolidate the the uh, the consolidation, the groups of teachers have to combine and they're all, you've still got that many teachers. You do eliminate maybe a, uh, some administrative positions, mm -hmm. but uh, consolidation does not and will not solve our uh, financial crisis. Now, I, I remember reading or being told that consolidating schools would allow smaller school districts to offer French or Spanish or, or 
uh, ancient history or, or some classes that many of the suburban schools have but the downstate schools can't afford because you can't get, if you have three kids wanting to take French, you can't very well justify having a French teacher. So in this climate, is that, should that thought be thrown out the window? Uh, no, I think that when you consolidate schools, you can offer more opportunities for kids mm -hmm. in, in those types of subjects. And there's a lot of research out there. What is a good size for a school? Mm -hmm. And too small is not so good, but too big is also not so good. So uh, a medium-sized school, I think, could offer anything that the you know the students mm -hmm. want or need, and and serve themselves very well. But in our region. It would take two or three districts going together to uh, really change um, much what what they're offering in the curriculum. Now you're talking about school school districts going together. The idea of losing community losing their school is a very very daunting prospect. Um, it is the identity of many many school districts. Mm -hmm is the towns are their schools, their sports teams, right. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, what do community leaders think about uh, the prospect of schools eroding in front of them? Um, they're concerned, but just like parents, I don't think they know the extent of the impact that these cuts are having upon the kids in our schools mm -hmm. and our communities. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'll all see it after it happens. But I don't think they see the potential the way that I see and uh, district administrators are seeing what the impact will be on, on the town. Uh, let's go back to Neoga for a second. You know, part of the, part of the plan is mm -hmm. to bring more jobs in Illinois. Mm -hmm. And if we bring more jobs in, mm -hmm. you know, we'll be better off and that will help our economy. Well, the school district in Neoga is the third largest employer. And so you... You know, it just devastates a community. It takes jobs. It takes jobs away, mm -hmm. and they're jobs that are are good jobs, mm -hmm. and and uh, that people are trained to do. Now, you talk about the morale of the staffs, mm -hmm. of teachers and administrators, and 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 students, for that matter. In what ways is the morale affecting education? The, you, you say, well, we've got a lesson plan. Let's learn a lesson plan. Um, first of all, teachers are wonderful mm -hmm. and I've talked to teachers who are uh, potentially will get cut mm -hmm. uh, they don't know you know they might not know yet or know that it's inevitable that they're going to get cut and somehow and I don't know how they do it they can leave that aside and go into the classroom and meet their students as if the world is perfect mm -hmm. but you know inside they're they're scared to death and becoming a teacher is harder each and every day. And we talk about the impact on, you know, everything is impacted by this. Here at the university, programs mm -hmm. are likely to get cut eventually if we continue to cut pro other, you know, the curriculum in our schools, like the music programs and the art mm -hmm. programs and things like that. So it just, one thing kind of just adds on to another. And, um, you know, the morale of the kids suffer because they might be losing their favorite teacher or their favorite coach. The morale of the staff suffers because they don't, they feel like that they're being dissed mm -hmm. as a professional educator. Mm -hmm. The morale of the administrators cut because they can't possibly do what's expected of them with limited resources. And poor superintendents. Now, <laughs> I just <laughs> met with them this morning and uh, they are, you know, I had one of them tell me that I am, I just can't, tell people bad news any longer because that's all I ever have to tell them is bad news. And it just kind of wears on you. So it's the sort of, it sounds to me that we, we're, we're at, if not the bottom, I hope, let's hope we're at the bottom. What, if you close your eyes and dream, and what can we do to fix it? Well, First of all, I'm not sure we're at the bottom because okay. all the people that are out there in charge of budget making and, and uh, decision making are saying it's going to get worse. Well, I okay. don't see how it's going to get worse. But you know what? In uh, a few years ago, we uh, the automobile industry was 
bad, hurting, and we bailed them out. You know, someone's going to have to bail us out or something because we've got people that are willing to work. It's about the future of our our uh, communities and mm -hmm. it's about the future of our country. And, and people are gonna have to start standing up and talking to legislators and people who are in charge of money and saying, if, if, if anything, education is the foundation of our nation. Mm -hmm. And so come on, help us out here. So how do you convince, you know, what arguments do you put forward? How, I mean, when you look at Washington sequester, you look at the state and it's, and the, the, the funding crisis they're having with the, you know, blaming it on the pension or, mm -hmm. you know, you know, what's our way out of this? Well, for one thing, I think we as educators are going to have to have a louder voice. We're too nice. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, and you are, in fact, nice. Yes. We just have let it be done to us mm -hmm. year after year after year. And we've got to go out and, and become more visible and become heard. Uh, and to make sure that everybody in our community knows what's happening to our schools and our kids. Mm -hmm. I, I think that is probably the one thing that I uh, want, to, want to convey mm -hmm. to anyone that's the least bit interested in education. So it's a public relations, it's a political act, activity, it's... Yes. Now, how do you, how do you get communities and um, involved in working together in the same direction. You have lots of different, you know. Um, you know, you, go to these communities that, that were on the air a little bit yeah. earlier, and one way you can really get community involvement is to tell them you're going to take their school away or that you're going to cut a bunch of programs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wish that we could start being a little more proactive than that and, and kind of put a roadmap out there that if we do this now, this could happen later, and if we don't do it now, mm -hmm. this is gonna happen later, and get, the, and get the community involved that way. Have more community meetings on education. Get more people involved in going to board meetings so that they know what's happening in the school. We, and you know, we, we all are a little complacent at times when we think things are going okay. Mm -hmm. So I was glad that to be here today to let people out there know that this is a crisis mm -hmm. and we have got to step up here and be heard. How do you get people involved? I mean, I've been involved in PTOs. I've mm -hmm. been involved in, in my children's schools. It's the same five or six parents that show up for all that other stuff. How do you get parents to get scared enough to act? That's a very good question. If I had the answer to that, I probably <laughs> You'd write would, the book. would become a little bit wealthy. But um, we, too, have to become involved in the political aspects of mm -hmm. this. And I think that is of major importance. You know, nobody knows in the end how the budget is going to work out. Right. Everybody is just supposing what mm -hmm. may happen. But if we can really get united and go to our legislators and say, this is happening. Now, I'll give the legislators... Uh, you know, credit. They have been visiting our schools and talking with administrators, and so they've got a, they've got a feel for what's happening. But I still don't think they know the extent mm -hmm. uh, in which our kids are hurting because of cuts that continue to be made in education. Okay. If things continue as they are going, as they are, and okay, so a kid doesn't have art and music, big mm -hmm. deal. Kid doesn't have you know band. Kid doesn't have. Uh, freshman soccer. Big deal. Well, how is that going to hurt them? Um, the, those kids are, some of them are going to stop coming to school because there's no attraction to them. Mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be more kids truant on our streets. Uh, there's going to be less culture in the community. In most communities, the school is the provider mm -hmm. of culture. Mm -hmm. When you don't have culture in a community, the whole environment suffers. Um, if we continue to cut, schools are going to have to shut down because they don't have money. They're already using up their savings. Mm -hmm. uh, then kids are going to have to get on a bus and, and ride a long way to somewhere they might not even want to be. Okay. The identities are stripped of people uh, by all these cuts. So uh, it's dire getting dire -er. It's more than dire. Okay. It is an emergency. So your, your take home from this is get involved, get active, mm -hmm. make your voice heard. 
you have to have your voice heard. We've been nice too long. We have got to put it out there that we are facing the end of public education as we know it unless changes are made. Well, it's scary. I thought we'd be a little bit uh, more <laughs> looking forward at the end of this program, but mm -hmm. this is really great information. This is an important topic. I'm sure we won't hear the last of this, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll be looking back at this topic again in the future. So okay. Dr. Bobby Mattingly, uh, the Regional Superintendent of Schools for uh, REO 11. Uh, it's ROE. ROE, excuse me, <laughs> REO. Speedwagon. Okay, well, thank you very much for being here. It is my pleasure.